sex. <laughs> in the University of Jason Robel, we did a study. That's, my, that's just me, University of Jason Robel, by the way. That, that most people uh, think about uh, one of three subjects. They think about food, they think about sex, and they think about baby animals. Although not together, because that would be really kinky and weird. No judgment, though. No judgment. But sex is something that, I mean, let's face it, it's the reason why we're here, right? Literally. This is not some trivial thing. It's the reason why we are in these bodies right now, okay? It's the reason why we're here together in this room. Sex is something that is, is, is such a layered, interesting concept and subject in our society because it brings up so much for us. It brings up self-worth issues. It brings up a sense of ethics, of shame, of identity, of ego, of pleasure, of pain. There are so many layers to sex, and that's why I love talking about it, and especially related to how we can optimize our sexual experience with our food and our lifestyle choices. So we're gonna dig into a whole lot of subject matter. I'm going to be very tangential today. Okay, so what that means is I'm just gonna bounce, kind of like, uh, like Naked Twister. That's a great way to get to know someone, by the way. <laughs> FYI. Like, if you really want to get to know someone really quickly, play a game of Twister without your clothes on. Really great way to get to know everybody at the party. So I'm going to be like naked Twister with you guys today, just going around for many subjects, because it is about how to eat and live for better sex. Now, when we talk about living for better sex, to me, at the core of it, yes, from a biological perspective, sex is about procreation. But beyond that, I, I really believe that sex and sexual experiences can truly be a, a doorway to not only pleasure, deep, deep, sustaining pleasure, pleasure that can actually add years to our life and longevity, but in my practice and what I've experienced, it can be a, a gateway and a portal to divine experiences if we really prep ourselves and we, and we can perceive the experience in the right way. And when we talk about perception, what I want to talk about, first of all, before we get into the things I think that will assist you with your sexual experiences, is the things that are probably inhibiting them. So, first of all, I want to take an informal survey. We're going to get to know each other without the naked twister part. <laughs> Who's already had sex at Wanderlust Festival? Raise your hands. <laughs> That's it? The whole crowd, is everybody being honest? Or are you guys just shy? Haven't been yet. Haven't been yet? Okay. Well, well, just to, well, you've got time. You've got time. You've got time. You've got time. Ease on into it. Ease on in. What we just, you're like, we just, God, give us a break, dude. We've been here an hour. Come on. Rapide, um, rapide. So when we talk about why we are having sexual issues in this world, I think there are so many layers to this subject, but number one, I think the, the biggest thing getting in the way of us not only having sex, but good nourishing sex. That's the, that's the word I want to focus on in, is nourishing sex, pleasure-filled sex, the connection with the divine I mentioned. The number one thing getting in this way, I think, is stress. Oh, stress, right? Because think about this. When you've had a really, really hard day and you're just full of tension and anxiety and you kind of look like a, like a gargoyle when you get home, you know, you, like... Are you thinking about having sex when you're in this state? Does anybody want to have sex with you? Probably not. Okay? So stress is, is not only from, from, from a mental perspective. We're so focused on, when we're in stress mode, the things that are going wrong. We're in fight or flight. We're retaining a lot of negative, tense energy in our body. But beyond that, unabated chronic stress can really get in the way of healthy sex because it messes with our hormones. It messes with our physiology and our chemistry. And here's one reason why. We talk about our hormone levels. Hormones are one of the keys I'm going to tap into, especially when we get into how to eat for better sex. We're going to talk about hormones. We're going to talk about brain chemistry. We're going to talk about preparing the body. But when we're in a constant, unabated stress state, the number one hormone that goes through the roof is our cortisol. So cortisol is that fight or flight response, right? It's that primal thing that when we were in the... the the jungles and the caves and the woods and getting lost in Tremblant, which I did yesterday a little bit. It was very fun getting lost, but I found my way back. That thousands of years ago, right, that, that cortisol, that adrenaline had a purpose, which was saber-toothed tiger, run, right, or fight the saber-toothed tiger. I personally would run, 
I'm a better runner than I am a fighter, better lover than a fighter too. But anyway, my point is this, we are still perceiving these threats in our world and there are no saber tooth tigers, right? It's, oh my God, the rent check bounced. Uh, oh my God, she didn't text me back in 30 minutes. We still have this elevated cortisol and adrenaline response where there are no direct perceived threats. It's the saber tooth tigers of the mind now. So these elevated cortisol levels get in the way not only because they keep us in this chronic stress state, they increase our blood pressure, they do undue damage to our heart and our arteries, but they're also getting in the way of our sex hormones like testosterone. When your cortisol and your adrenaline is elevated, your testosterone goes down, right? So the number one hormone we need to elevate for a higher sex response and a higher libido is testosterone. This isn't just for guys, because when we talk about testosterone, guys, you think like testosterone, yeah! Mm. But ladies too, like that thing, that primal like thing, that Marvin Gaye you feel, you know, let's get it on, which lives somewhere here. It's where that song came from, I think. <laughs> At least that's where I feel it when I'm singing it. Uh, that's a testosterone thing. So when we, when we take our mindfulness practices, meditation, walking, deep breathing, pranayama, right? Let's say we get home, we've had a stressful day, we wanna connect with our lover. Instead of being like, oh, all right, baby, let's, let's, oh, come on, baby, give me some. Like, you don't want gargoyle sex. Again, you want to like, <sighs> take a moment, breathe. Do what you need to do for yourself to reduce that cortisol, reduce that adrenaline response, get to a calm state, right? Because the thing is too, beyond just the elevated hormone levels, we want to talk about presence, right? Because when you're in that stress state and you want to make love to someone, have sex with someone, is there going to be a lack of presence? And presence to me, I think, is one of those portals into the gateway of the divine, those really transcendent sexual experiences, the ones where time and space dissolves and you're like completely out of your body. I think there's a, there's a French term, uh, I'm going to butcher this because I do not speak French well, so I'm sorry in advance. Uh, le petit mot, the little death, did I pronounce that correctly? Le petit mot, 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 I'll get it. We got time. I've only been here a couple hours as well. So the little death, right? This transcendent experience where, where you literally have this experience of dissolving with this other person. There's this unity. You don't even exist anymore, even if for a few fleeting moments, right? These are the kind of experiences I want us all to learn how to cultivate. So I think number one, reducing our stress, breathing, relaxation, but then also practicing presence, right? So many of us practice presence with meditation, walking, yoga, but then when, when it comes to our sex life, it's like the presence goes out the window, right? Have you experienced this? I absolutely have. It's like, oh, where's the, where's the trail? Well, it's only in the meditation room. No, 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 it's in every room you walk through. You know, a lot of the yogis say it's very easy to go into a mountaintop and be in a cave and practice meditation there and practice mindfulness there, but when you're in the world, and you're out, that's where the real meditation practice is. So I think in our sexual experiences, in our sex life, that element of presence is so key. Because for me, I know that, and we'll get deep into like the societal, here's the tangential part, here's the naked twister part. For me, I feel that I am still working through a lot of this, not only self-imposed, but societally imposed in pressure to do it right. Like as the man, like I wanna make her feel good. And sometimes for me that devolves into a very mechanical type of thinking where I'm no longer here or here, it's here. The whole sexual experience is, is here. So I'm, I'm not present anymore because I'm thinking about the mechanics of it and I want to make her feel good. So if I'm focusing too hard on I want to make her feel good or I want to make myself feel good, I'm not dropped in. We're losing a massive part not only of our physical experience but our spiritual experience of sex. So moving away from the, the mechanics of it and am I doing it right? And yes, I mean, there's training involved. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm still a young Jedi. I'm still a young Padawan with the, with the lightsaber. <laughs> I had to. I was like, this is, yeah, it's going to go there. Okay. You know, it, it, and it's not to say that a lot of our most amazing sexual discoveries hasn't been through ingenuity and imagination. I'm not saying take the mind out of it completely, but I'm saying in the sexual act, try your best to really just be with someone, be in their eyes, take in their essence, not be thinking about, ah, I gotta make this feel good, I've gotta do this, I've gotta do that. I've gotta, to me, it's like, I've gotta last. In like the yoga community, like, thank you, Sting, right? The, the Tantra thing, 
which was my understanding of Tantra before I actually started practicing it with Dawn Cartwright. If you guys don't know who Dawn, Dawn Cartwright is, she's an amazing uh, tantric therapist and instructor. But my whole thing was like, oh my God, Sting's having sex for five hours? <laughs> five hours? I gotta do that. <laughs> but it became this, this, this sense of mechanics rather than dropped in full presence with my lover, right? So the other thing for men and women, if you feel you've gotten into this mode of I've got to do it right, I've got to please myself, please this person, I've got to be the best lover ever, try your best just to dissolve that thinking and drop more into the presence with the person you're with because you're not doing it wrong. There is no, with sex there is no right or wrong. Now it's not to say you haven't had kind of uncomfortable or bad sexual experiences. I mean. There's been a few that have been like, oh, this is uncomfortable because sex also challenges us. It brings up our deepest traumas, right? It brings up our deepest sense of self-worth or lack thereof. Sex is a tremendous healer. And so to shy away from the experience of that connection and that vulnerability, I think sometimes is trying to avoid that deep work. Can anyone relate to that? Sometimes when we shut down during sex, maybe it's that we don't really want to have that deeper level of connection and vulnerability because it brings up a lot, right? I mean, there, there's been times where I've had experiences where it was like, oh, I didn't know that was there, oh my God. And you get cracked so wide open. But that's that divine experience of being open to that with someone and really showing your truest self. And, and as a man growing up, as an American male, that's not something that's encouraged, right? Like for me growing up, it was just like, yep, and I'm gonna use some profanity, I apologize in advance, but just like, yep, just, you know, for guys, it was just like, be this fuck machine all the time. It was like this very mechanical thing in my society though, honestly, of, of, of just, this is what you're doing. Like it's this very disconnected, unemotional experience that I was taught to have as a young man. So for me, I've had to retrain myself to learn how to be vulnerable during sex and how to trust that opening. You know, I mean, I remember, I remember the first time like I cried during sex. It was like, oh my, guys aren't supposed to do this. Guys aren't supposed to do this. Guys aren't supposed to do this. You're not present. Wait, I am. Just allow it, right? So there's so many layers and, and I wish I had hours to talk about this, but it really goes back to this willingness of, are you willing to be there fully? Not just part of you, not just here, but are you willing to drop in and allow what wants to come up instead of trying to control the experience? Because I think in the, in the experiences of life where we're the most vulnerable, we sometimes have a tendency to want to control those experiences. Like, I'm going to show you something, but I'm not going to show you everything. Because that would be way too scary, right? But I think sex is the perfect place to be fully vulnerable. I truly do. So in going on to how we can live for better sex, we've got dealing with our stress, conscious mindfulness practices, we're talking about our, our practice of presence now. You know, another way that you can do that in, in terms of practicing presence is, um, is couple breathing. Like one thing that I really love to do with my partner is actually do, there's a shared breath technique. It's a one breath technique where you can actually breathe into each other and you're just recycling the same breath over and over. And for a lot of us, especially if we've been in relationships for a long time, there can be a tendency to just be like, okay, babe, let's get it on. Like the presence goes out the window. But I think in long-term relationships, it's a perfect opportunity to really practice some of these deeper, more rooted spiritual practices. And the one breath technique is one thing that I really love, is especially if we've both had a stressful day, is to drop in, really, really be present with each other, and then practice this one breath. So that means when I breathe out into her, into her mouth, into her being, she takes it in and breathes it back. So there's this reciprocal breathing that gets passed. It's this interesting, prana technique that can really build the energy. And this can be a non-physical energy. This can just be breathing into each other before you even touch each other. And then we get into the subject of foreplay, right? Which is, that foreplay can take on many forms, right? Foreplay can just be, it, it can depend on your love languages, honestly. You guys familiar with the five love languages? Okay, so right, that's kind of a, a form of foreplay, if you will. If you're with someone who's willing to understand what your love languages are, Mine's physical touch and words of affirmation, right? So I know that even non-sexual physical touch, even like one of my favorite things in the world, this is me getting vulnerable. <laughs> one of my favorite things in the world is just getting kissed on my forehead. It's the simplest thing in the world, right? And then when someone knows that and like they take the time just to like touch my face and kiss me on my forehead, I can feel that so deeply. It's like, it's like we're, not even, we're not even in the sexual act yet, 
But it's this thing of like, this person knows me. They, they acknowledge that this is how I like to be loved. And so in relationship with our partners, it's an opportunity to communicate how we feel best loved. And one thing that I like to do with um, the person I'm dating, my partner, whatever the context is, is to physically ask them, how can I love you best right now? That's a very powerful question to ask someone that you love. And it can even be a family member, it can be a sister, brother, it doesn't have to be a, a romantic lover, but asking someone, how can I love you best right now? It is amazing the answers you will get back. And in kind, you practicing that, right? Like soliciting that question, like, can we have this dialogue? Can we open this loving communication? I would like you to ask me how I'd like to be loved best right now, right? Because that opens such a beautiful dialogue of sharing how you receive love and how you give love. And I think one of the mistakes potentially that we make in relationship is thinking that the other person speaks our love language or, you know, well, you're supposed to know. I've heard that. I've actually said that too in a relationship. Like, you're just supposed to know. That's crazy. That's insane. They're not supposed to know. Communication, oh, Dr. Emily, communication is lubrication, right? <laughs> communication is lubrication. It's true. It's like, it's like the more that we open up and discuss freely our desires, our wants, our needs, our fears, our traumas around sex, that's when the real deep union starts to begin, I believe. So if we go into food, we go into the, the biology and the chemistry. I touched on hormones a little bit in the beginning. We talk about decreasing cortisol, decreasing adrenaline, and calming, and also testosterone, right? That beautiful testosterone response where it's that primal libido, like, I want to eat you up, baby, cover you in chocolate sauce. <laughs> Make sure it's raw. And here's why. I'll tell you in a second why. Chocolate is actually one of the best foods for sex. We'll get into that in a second. So testosterone. Testosterone is uh, very important as we age, along with human growth hormone, for keeping ourselves vibrant and youthful and our libido high. One easy way to boost testosterone, guys, is to do weight-bearing exercise. So a lot of people, anybody here into CrossFit, lifting, anybody lift anything of any kind? Yeah, a few people. Okay, who did their chaturangas this morning? Who's done chaturangas? Okay, yes, chaturangas, good. Elbows in. Sometimes you can flare them up, but that puts too much stress on the shoulders. Okay. Done a few yoga classes. So the thing is when we do weight-bearing exercises, when we work against the force of gravity, specifically lifting weights, right? We do CrossFit, weightlifting. This is a great way to easily boost our testosterone. Right, number one. So if you're doing any kind of gravity, weight-bearing exercise, very healthy for testosterone. Um, another thing too is there's been a lot of momentum in the oil-free diet craze uh, as of late, but research has shown that when we eat healthy fats, specifically cold-pressed, extra virgin, organic plant fats, that that actually has a great response with our testosterone production. So oil-free, yes, can be great in some ways in terms of our diet in allaying some of the potential effects of cardiovascular disease if people have certain cancers. But in terms of our hormone production, not only testosterone, but estrogen, progesterone, we need a healthy amount of fat and oil in our diet. So you can get that from you know, nuts, seeds, you can get that from, I mean, I'm a huge avocado fan. Like every day I eat an avocado, I should probably invest in a farm at this point, like invest in avocado futures on the stock market. Like, I didn't know you could invest in avocado futures. Yeah, Jason Robel made that up because he eats so many. So healthy fats are tremendous for our hormone production. So if you're staying away from fat, you're staying away from oil, I highly encourage you to re-examine the research regarding hormone production and healthy fat and oil intake. Now beyond that, some of the other nutrients and foods that are tremendous for our sexual health B vitamins, B complex vitamins, that can be B6, B9, and B12. Uh, speaking of avocados, guys, anybody know what the origin of the word avocado, where that comes from? Oh, this is exciting. Okay, I want you to imagine, okay, right now, guys, imagine a, an avocado in your mind's eye, just floating in space. A giant, creamy avocado, perfect, when you perfectly green, no brown spots, no dents. You know when you go to the farmer's market or the store and you find that perfect avocado and it's like the, the heavens open and it's like, oh, <laughs> that feeling. True. Imagine that. The avocado comes from the ancient Mesoamerican word ahuacatl, which translates to testicle. 
So if we think about, oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. That makes sense. It'd be tough to carry. That'd be. I'd have to get better drop crotch pants if that were the case. If they were as big as avocados, they're not. <laughs> no worries. Uh, avocados, full of B-complex vitamins, very nourishing for our sex glands and our sex hormones, men and women, and guess what? Full of healthy fat, so they help with testosterone production. Another key nutrient that we need is zinc. Especially for men, when men ejaculate, they lose a tremendous amount of nutrients, in particular zinc though. So for men and women, particularly men though, uh, pumpkin seeds are an amazing source of zinc. So we need to replenish. So uh, there's been a few times that I've been like, oh, baby, I gotta go to the kitchen. What do you gotta go to the kitchen for? <laughs> Coconut water and pumpkin seeds. <laughs> Co by the way, coconut water after sex, like keep it on hand, especially if it's the first time, right? And someone's like, why are you running off to the kitchen? You'd be like, it's worth it. You come back with like fresh cracked coconut. They're like, what are you bringing a cleaver into the bedroom? Baby, I got you. But a fresh cracked coconut right after sex, oh, it's glorious. It's glorious. So I guess food and sex do, com yeah, they're compatible in the bedroom. Um, so let's go back to chocolate, right? I'm gonna, is there anybody who doesn't like chocolate? <sighs> yes. Why? I only like the very like bitter and dark 70 over percent, but the rest is too sweet. What's the cutoff for you? Percent? 70. Okay, she doesn't like it bitter or dark. You, my dear. No, I like it, but oh, I oh, oh, you, oh, you do I like it. Like the sweet oh, well, then I got. Oh, you're gonna love what I got to say then. Yes. <laughs> I don't like the dark chocolate. I just, I like the fat version. But you do eat some chocolate? <laughs> Not really. No. She loves chips. <laughs> chips? <laughs> How is that a substitute for chocolate? <laughs> Oh, salt. Oh, you're a salty kind of girl. You a salty kind of girl. I got you. Okay, baby. Okay. I got you. You more salt than pepper. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about... Um, okay, so this may, this may change your mind. It may not. Chocolate is one of the best sex foods for so many reasons. Uh, number one, let's talk about our brain chemistry for a second. For me, when I have a breakup, I'm eating so much chocolate, like they need to like put a line to Ecuador and be like, he just broke up again. <laughs> Increase the production right now. Do it. I eat so much chocolate. And here's the reason. We know that chemically there are two phenomenal uh, components to chocolate. There's um, anandamide and phenylethylamine. And anandamide and phenylethylamine are two of the chemicals that are released when we're in love. I mean like, I mean like crazy gaga goo goo in love like, I can't imagine my life without you. Baby, I eat and sleep and drink you, oh. You know that like you wanna write, love. you're not, you don't even write love songs and yet you're like writing loves, you know, what's come over me? That kind of love. But when we break up, we are literally chemically addicted to that person. Like this has been proven on a chemical perspective. We are chemically addicted to this person. So why do we reach for the chocolate? Because we're addicts. Now it's not a bad thing, it's not a bad thing. This is not a bad thing. But by selecting dark chocolate or raw chocolate, there are two reasons why we want to do that. Number one, they're more nutritionally dense. And number two, they found that when you actually have an interaction with dairy products, with milk and cacao, it nullifies a lot of the nutritional benefits. So if you're eating milk chocolate, you are not getting anywhere near the amount of benefit nutritionally that if you eat raw or dark chocolate. That's just a, a chemical fact and how they interact. So dark chocolate or raw chocolate, we've got the phenylethylamine, the PEA. We have the anandamide, these bliss chemicals in the brain. But beyond that, chocolate is the highest known source of magnesium in any food. So cacao, dark chocolate or raw cacao, has this magnesium. And magnesium is important for several reasons. Number one, blood flow. It is the master mineral in increasing blood flow to all parts of the body. And we know that for sensation, for all of our parts to work well, we need healthy blood flow. So magnesium is critical for that reason. Magnesium is critical for a second reason, is it helps to relax our central nervous system. 
We go back to the original point I made when we, we began about unabated stress getting in the way of healthy, nourishing sex. So we've got blood flow, yes. We've got reduction of stress, yes. And guess what? Uh, fellas and the ladies who love them, the guys who love them, the animals who love them, whatever. There's another side benefit to magnesium. When you wake up in the morning, it's like you've gone camping. <laughs> I'm serious. It's, ama it's t called tenting, guys. Is that an American thing, tenting? <laughs> okay, not all jokes work here. Tremblant. Okay, okay, ten, you guys, ten, okay, so yeah, you got it, okay, great. It's like, wow, I'm like 16 again, this is amazing. So healthy blood flow, reduction of stress, and a lot of virility. So magnesium is phenomenal for that reason. You could do that through chocolate, uh, or I highly recommend ionic liquid magnesium supplements. There's also a, a supplement out there called Calm, Calm, which is great, it's like a powder. But either way, um, magnesium is so important because it's the mineral that most human beings are deficient in. So make sure that you increase not only your zinc, as we talked about, you increase your healthy fats, but you're increasing your magnesium and also your B vitamins. So beyond that, you know, if we look at some kind of tangential super herbs and superfoods, do you guys want me to get into that for a second? Kind of like the weird stuff? Talk about the weird, the weird stuff? Okay, so the weird stuff. There's Damiana. Damiana is an amazing aphrodisiac and libido booster. D-A-M-I-A-N-A, -A -A, Damiana flower. Uh, beyond that, there's also epimedium extract, which is called horny goat weed. <laughs> horny goat weed, yeah. I mean, no one refers to it as epimedium because that's like the biological, but it's called horny goat weed, which every time I see it, I think of like just this goat, like, <laughs> like kind of back to the gr but see, animals don't care. By the way, did you know that, that humans, uh, we're in a very small group of mammals that have sex for pleasure? Anybody want to guess what the other two are? Dolphins. Dolphins. Anybody want to guess the third? Bonobo. Bonobo. Who said bonobo? Oh. Yes. Katie, very good. Yeah, dolphins and bonobos. Now, I always wonder how they obtain this information. You know, do they like, excuse me, Mr. Dolphin, are you enjoying this? Yeah, like, how do they know? Who are they? Like, the dolphins aren't saying, like, because dolphins don't have thumbs. But, you know, like, how do they know this? But bonobos are interesting because they actually engage in conflict resolution through sex, right? Like if there's, a tr if there's trouble like in the tribe of bonobos, they'll be like, let's get in. Okay, yep, we got this. Sorry. Right, so, so we're a, a very small group that has sex for pleasure on this planet. So we go back to this original intention of, of, of why are we here? Are we here to simply procreate and prosper? Or are we here to like have a visceral sensual experience of life and share that with each other. You know, so again, I think sex is, is, is so interesting for all those reasons. Tangential, I told you, I'm coming back. Superfoods. We talked about Damiana, we talked about Epimedium. Here's another one that is amazing. Anybody do maca powder? Maca, okay. Uh, can anyone vouch for its benefits? Yeah, every, <laughs> so shy in this corner, you guys are like, yes, I can vouch. <laughs> maca powder. Maca is a, um, it's a, it's a root, it's, it almost looks like a giant radish, uh, native to South America, and you, most of the production comes from Peru. And what they do is um, they roast it or gelatinize it. I do not recommend raw maca because the chemical constituents are not the same as if it's gelatinized or roasted. But what this does is it, it's in a class of foods called adaptogens. And adaptogens have this ability to regulate our hormones uh, in a very interesting way. So let's say you need energy to go out and make love or run after a saber-toothed tiger. tiger. Maca can do that. It'll, it'll upregulate or downregulate your hormones depending on what your body needs. So it's an intelligent food. Adaptogens are a class that are hormone regulating and they're intelligent foods. There's a wisdom in those foods. So maca powder, what I like to do is I'll make like a malt. Do you, uh, again, Canada, do, do we do malts here? Malt beverages? Okay. I've only been in Canada like five times. I don't know what you guys eat other than poutine. <laughs> Oh, they're like, ah, oh, we eat more than poutine. Do you, I know, I was in Montreal for, oh my God, I want to move to Montreal. You think I'm kidding, Katie? I'm moving to Mont, no, like, let it, like, guys, I, I love, I'm like, oh my God, I love you, Montreal. I love Montreal, I really do. So, so, FYI, I might be getting a chalet. Maca powder. 
maca. You can make malt beverages, malt drinks out of it. You can put it into puddings. You can make it in smoothies. I don't really use it in savory dishes so much because it kind of has this slight roasted caramel type of undertone. So I usually use it in desserts or sweet things. The other thing, and this is, this is if you get, oh man, I saved the best for last. If you get this, you're gonna be like, we named our firstborn after you, Jason. <laughs> I'm serious. It, you, this, is a this is like a warning label needs to be put on this one. This one is called Sistanche. C-I-S-T-A-N-C-H-E. C-I-S-T-A-N-C-H-E. Sistanche. And it is a Chinese herb that helps to tonify the spleen in the kidneys. Primarily is what it's used for. It's a Jing herb. Jing is just another word for like kind of life force energy. Like Jing is, Jing is the primal essence, the energy we were born with that gets depleted through the course of our life. And we can replenish this Jing energy with certain lifestyle practices, breathing, meditation, and food. So the, it, it's a Jing herb that replenishes our primal essence. But the other benefit is, oh my God, it is like nature's Viagra. I'm serious. No, in Los Angeles, we call it sustanch in your pants. <laughs> it's, it's, oh, just get it. Put it in your tonics, put it in your hot cocoa, put it in your smoothies and report back to me. It's, it, you can overdo it. That's all I got to say. Cause like you hear like, I've never done Viagra, but I've heard like five hour erection. That's a long time to have an erection unless you're sting. Is it better for women or men? Both. Works for both, but, but it, it is a very potent response. Uh, again, it's primarily used to, to tonify the chi, the kidney and, and liver energy, but I, for whatever reason they don't advertise on the package, it's like <laughs> uh, So sustanch. So any combination of those type of superfoods, try playing with those, adding them to your smoothies, your desserts. Um, but I wanna bring it back to, to this journey because I really think that sex is an amazing teacher for all of us. And if we do it with the intention of pleasure and of connection and vulnerability and using it as a tool to not only learn about ourselves but learn about the person that we're loving, it can be again a gateway into the divine and a gateway into that little death, that dissolving of our sense of self and merging with the oneness. So I have so much more to talk on but we are, we are out of time and I want to get to a Q&A. So Thank you, thank you so much for joining me for this sex talk first thing in the morning. I appreciate you guys very much. Thank you for being here.